Hello, I'm John Wilson. Welcome to Master Tapes, the series in which I talk to songwriters about the making of a key album of their career. In the case of today's guest, though, there are simply too many albums to choose from, so we're not looking just at one album, but at far more than that. We make Master Tapes here at the BBC's historic Maida Vale Studios, a place that our guest first visited as a young member of a hotly tipped band in 1963. So sit back and enjoy a conversation with the most successful songwriter of all time in Master Tapes. Live and let die. So Paul McCartney. Welcome to Master Tapes. And to Sir Paul McCartney playing live for our audience here at the BBC Maida Vale Studios. Paul is here to look back at his life in music as a composer, as a solo artist, as the leader of Wings, and as one quarter of, well, the greatest group of all time. Paul, welcome to Master Tapes. Thank you. The Master Tapes is a programme which we, we ask songwriters to kind of almost deconstruct their art to take you back to the building blocks. And in a way, you did that in 1970, after the end of the Beatles, with that first album, with McCartney, a really DIY home job. You played every instrument. It was taking yourself back to the basics, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was kind of difficult to know what to do, you know, after the Beatles. How do you follow that? And um, so I'd been doing a lot of stuff just at home, writing and things. So I asked my mate, Eddie Klein, who's my studio manager, um, could he get me a Studer machine, one of those old four-track Studers that we recorded Sgt. Pepper on and most of our Beatles stuff? Could he get me one of them? And I would plug into the back of it a microphone, get a guitar, play a bit, and then plug in another one. So I, I just plugged the microphones into the back of this thing. And so it was very homemade. Was there a sense of musical liberation because you didn't have to answer to three other people because you could do exactly what you wanted to for the first time? Yeah, but, um, I mean, we all pretty much did what we wanted to in the Beatles. There wasn't a lot of sort of fighting about stuff. So it wasn't too much that. It was just really something to do to get over the shock of not being in the Beatles anymore. Because, yeah. you know, that's all I'd ever known musically. Um, I'd either been in the Quarrymen or the Silver Beatles or the Beatles. <laughs> and then suddenly I was in nothing. So it was like... Hmm, yeah. okay. I guess there were songs on there that probably would have made it onto Beatles albums if, if you'd stayed... Um, maybe I'm amazed is a case in point, isn't it? Yeah. You can hear that as a possible... as a Beatles tune. It's a great... it's a declaration of love. Baby, I'm amazed at the way you love me all the time and Maybe I'm afraid of the way I love you One of the lucky things after the Beatles broke up was that I found Linda so, you know, the two of us had this bond that could fight the world. And um, in writing that song, uh, I was trying to get my feelings about, you know, maybe I'm amazed at the way I leave you and why do I do that? And, and you know, the way you pull me out of time and hung me on a line and stuff. I was just trying to get my feelings into that song and um, express my love for her, really, yeah. So in writing that and writing it for her, it kind of strengthened our bond and gave me a bit of strength to go forward. Because, mm. you know, there's a danger that you just go, I can't do it. Because, you know, like I say, you say follow that with the Beatles, but it really isn't an easy act to follow, you know. 
it was, it was good. It was good making that record, um, just as a liberation, just just um, to get away from. There were a lot of heavy business meetings yeah. at that time, and that was doing my head in, you know. So it was like, no, I'm about music. I've just got to keep doing music, and something will come out, you know. I mean, one of the things we used to say in the Beatles was, something will happen. And it sounds like mundane, you know, but uh, it came from an occasion when we were coming in the van from uh, London to Liverpool, and it was a blizzard and it was snowing and everything, and uh, the van slipped off the motorway down down the embankment. <laughs> so we're like, oh! But it didn't roll or anything, so we're down at the bottom of this embankment in the snow. We think, well, there's no way we're going to get back up this embankment. And, you know... So she said, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And one of us, I can't remember, said, well, something will happen. <laughs> and it was like, yeah. <laughs> and that always became like the mantra, well, something will happen. And then so we, we flagged down a lorry driver and got a lift, you know, and yeah. something happened. She was just 17. talking about the music but the camaraderie there being in the gang but in 1970 i mean you had been mired in all those legal difficulties as well you think of a song like every night mm. which is about you know i want to go out want to get out of my head and then it sort of contradicts itself i just want to stay in and be with you it's about music as an escape as well isn't it from all this, the stress and the, the pressure yeah. of the outside world had it had it got too much oh yeah <laughs> definitely yeah um yeah well, a guitar can't pick up a guitar himself. <laughs> Certainly can't tune it. So, uh, good one. No, that was. Um, I bet that was basically started with a chord. You know, people say to me, "How do songs start?" And um, sometimes it's an idea. Sometimes it's think something you've been thinking about, and you. Um, but sometimes it's a kind of chord you like. So that's like a, a variation of E. So that's like the seventh. Yeah, it's the seventh. Thing. So that sets up the kind of mood of the song, you know. So. Every night I just want to go out, get out of my head. Every day I don't want to get up, get out of my bed. Every night I want to play out. Every day I want to do. So yeah, that's that sound of that. <laughs> but you'd, in terms of that escape, using music as a as a place as a as a way of getting away from the stress. But physically, you did it. You had the farm in Scotland. You moved to, to Kintyre yeah. at the time, and that yeah. kind of fed into the way the music was being made. I guess you particularly hear it on the next album, only a few months after Ram. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I say, you know. You were faced with the end of the Beatles and all these heavy business negotiations, which we never really had to face. And this charming guy called Alan Klein. Oh, he's a nice bloke, wasn't he? Yeah. Lovely man. Yeah. And um, so I didn't like him, to put it mildly. And he was going to screw us. He was going to take all the Beatles stuff. And he's actually took a bunch of stone stuff. They, there's some stuff that they don't own to this day because yeah. he took it. Um, so, yeah, so these meetings were, like, heavy because I was trying to resist, and I had to resist the other guys, which was the worst bit. If I had to just fight him, that would have been easy. But the other guys sort of sided with him, so everything he said, they sort of went, yeah, you know. I was like, no. I said, well, he wants 20%. Oh, what, of the Beatles? No. I mean, 10% is, like, what managers take, and try him with 10. No, he wants 20. Anyway, so it was, it was pretty heavy, you know. So uh, the thing was, well, what are we going to do? So one of the things was music. The other thing was get out of town, leave. So when they invite you, you know, there's a meeting on Thursday. So sorry, can't come. <laughs> We're in Scotland. So that was the that was the strategy. We just we just got out. <laughs> Were you depressed at the time? I mean, was it was it? Was I it was a depressed really at the time. Point? Yeah, you would be. You would be too if it happened to you. Um, yeah, you know, it was. 
very depressing, you know, because you were breaking from your lifelong friends. And even, I mean, we used to liken it to like um, the army, where you'd been army buddies for a few years, and now you weren't going to see him again. And there's an old song, Wedding Bells. Those wedding bells are breaking up this old gang of mine. And we kind of felt like that. We said, well, you know, but we, yeah. we're growing up, we're getting married, and we'll, we, we live separately. So, yeah, it was, but it was depressing. And with all the business stuff still going on, um, and not knowing whether I was going to continue in music, that was kind of depressing. Seriously, what you thought for a moment, this is it? Yeah, I mean, well, because the thing was, well, how are you going to do it? Mm. If you're going to do it, you can't play all the instruments yourself on stage. So how are you going to do this? And, uh, you know, I took to the bevies. I took to a wee drum. And, uh, you know, it was great at first. And then after a while, it was like, well, well, well. <laughs> getting up in the morning. No, I was, I was a bit far gone, you know. And uh, suddenly I wasn't having a good time. It wasn't working. And um, so, again, you know, it was Linda who sort of said, you know, you just, you've got to get it together and we've got to do something. So we ended up um, forming Wings. Yeah, so that explains, that's the reason you put another band together. You've been in a band for seven years. Mm. You could have been a big star as a solo artist, but that explains why you put Wings together, because you needed people to work with on the live stage. Yeah, so. I like the idea of a band, you know, um, because people said, well, you can get a big super, super group, get a load of stars and stuff. But I, for some mad reason, I wanted to kind of go back to square one yeah. and just do it as we'd done it in the Beatles. So people said, well, Linda can't play keyboards. And it was true, you know. <laughs> I said, well, I know, but, you know, and we couldn't play guitar. Someone. You yeah, know, John yeah. couldn't play guitar when we started. You know, he was playing banjo chords, you know. And we knew uh, Linda couldn't play. We knew we didn't know each other, and but she learned. And, uh, but we had some funny experiences. I mean, looking back on it, I'm really glad we did it because mm. it, it was, the way to do it. Like I say, I could have just gone into a super group and just rung up Eric, Jimmy Page, John Bonham or whatever. Uh, and, you know, just the mates and said, come on, guys, we're going to do it. But uh, for some reason, I wanted to go back. And it, it was quite funny. We, we ended up, as you say, playing uh, universities and graduated to town halls. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which was funny because I'd been in Shea Stadium yeah, yeah. quite recently, you know, and it was it was funny, you know. It was you had to hold your nerve, but then you do in life, you know. You've got to this. There's all all sorts of occasions that throw you, and you've got to decide. Okay, I'm going under or I'm going up. Yeah. And um, so we just decided to get out and do it, and it was funny. We ran Newcastle Town Hall once, and we were doing this song Wildlife. So, and Linda had the intro. It's just three little piano chords. Dun, 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 dun. And so I go, and I do a song now called Wildlife. One, two, three, one, two, three. Nothing. <laughs> I look around, she's going. <laughs> <laughs> so, now the audience love this. They think this is part of the show. Hey, <laughs> love it. I go, one, two, three, one, two, three. More nothing. So I turn around the audience by this time. I think, this is great. You know, they, they've, they've worked this out. This is their comedy bit. <laughs> so I go over to the piano. I go, and I can't remember the bloody <laughs> chords. So I said, oh, no. <laughs> Suddenly it comes back to her. And she goes, Ding, yes, my life. And we're off. But you oh. had fun. You took a pasting in the press, though, didn't you? I mean, yeah, initially. Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you enjoy that? Did you enjoy no. trying to? No. All no. Right. Who enjoys a pasting? Well, I wondered. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, I mean, it was it was very difficult, you know. And you learned, you remembered names that you were never going to need in, in your future life, but they were the people you hated because <laughs> they gave you really bad, vicious reviews, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, to be fair, we weren't that good, as I say, you know. But uh, Charles Shaw Murray shall ever be hated by me. Yeah. <laughs> it's good he's here today, then, isn't oh. it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Charlie. No, I don't. I hate you. If you're here, I still hate you. No, I don't. Forgive and forget. So you got Linda in the band, and you got Denny Lane as your wing as your wingman. But I mean, you know, you're out, you're out, and you are kind of 
defying expectations because with although we look back and band on the run becomes a big selling album i mean it gets you back there in mm. in a way into to where where people expect you to be but the mm. roots of that album are very strange because you headed to lagos nigeria mm. Mm. and you made that you made that all in a very small studio there in lagos why that place first of all um, it's a silly reason, really, but uh, I'd heard that EMI had studios all over the world. So I thought, well, this is good, you know, we could, I can get a list. So they sent me around a list, and it was like China, oh, that would be good, you know, so and so and so and so, and all these places. And then it was like Lagos, yeah. Africa. I thought, yeah, man. So I'm thinking, yeah, you know, ching, 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 we got it, the rhythms and stuff. I'm going to love it, the atmosphere of. Africa. So I chose to do that and they said, yeah, okay, this is, you know, we might have to do a little bit of work on the studio. It's not, not really the greatest ever. Um, and what happened was the, the night before we were going, two of my bandmates rang up and said, we're not coming. So I was like, oh, okay. Well, that left three of us, me, Danny and Linda. And uh, so then we were without a drummer and um, a guitar player, Jimmy and Danny decided not to come. So it was like, again, it was like, well, what are you going to do? Yeah. Cancel it all or just go and we'll think of something. I said, well, I can drum. So I, I drum on that album. And uh, you know what? It was a question of we'll show you. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Screw, screw me and I'll screw you back, <laughs> baby. Because, you know, we're going to make the best album ever. You know, so it was a good motivation for that album. I must say it was like, Yeah. We, we're not going to come out of this with a bad album. So really interesting. You say you headed off to Lagos, you know, because of the African rhythms. You don't hear any of that in Band on the Run, really. Does it? It, no. doesn't, it doesn't musically. It doesn't feed in no, at all. No, not really. No, it was the inspiration, you know. Um, and didn't fella, 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 fella Kuti, Ran, fella Ransan Kuti. He, yeah. he was a bit aggrieved that you'd taken, you had arrived and you were stealing Africa's music. Yeah, that's what he said. I I first knew about it um, when I read the local paper, the Lagos Gazette or something, you know, and he said. Fella accuses McCartney of stealing his music. So I'm going, what's this? I read it. And yeah, you know, fella's saying, oh, the white man's coming to Africa. He's going to steal our music and everything. And so I rang him up. So I said, is that fella? Yeah. I said, look, man, I'm not stealing anything. I really am not. I just love the atmosphere. I've come here, you know. I said, come around to the studio uh, and I'll prove it. I'll, I'll play you what we recorded, I'll play you the songs we intend to record, and you'll see, you know, for yourself. So he came round with like an uh, entourage of about 30. He had 30 wives for a start, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know. And oh. his mate, this guy, Chief Abiuro, used to say to him, call me Mac, Mac, why you not have 30 wives? <laughs> <laughs> I said, one's enough. But uh, yeah, I know, so I persuaded him, you know, and we became good friends, actually. He invited us out to uh, this club, the African Shrine. shrine yeah. Yeah. You went to the Shrine, did you? Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Crazy experience. Um, it really was. I mean, people talk about the black experience, and I'd heard the phrase, well, here w we were, the only whites in the middle of, you know, Nigeria. And I didn't know whether it was safe or not. Yeah. You got mugged out there, didn't you? Didn't you lose all we the demo mugged. tapes at one point? Yeah, oh, I had all the demo tapes to Band on the Run. Yeah. And uh, everyone is, you know, we are daft. We are stupid people, I must admit, but lovely with it. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and people, people when we went there said one thing, what you'd never do, walk at night on your own, get a car. Yeah. But it was so great, it was the African skies. So me and Linda had been out to see some mates. So we said, well, we're gonna walk home. It doesn't matter. So we're walking, we've got cameras, tapes. I got all the cassettes, <laughs> got every cash, you know, walking along. Uh, it was hilarious, really, when you look back on it, although it was very dangerous. Um, a car pulls up and goes, pulls up there. And the guy winds down his window and um, he's, he, he looks at me and I sort of say, hey, I assume he wants to give us a lift. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, like I say, I'm thick. But, <laughs> but, you know, it kind of worked just about. So I go, listen, mate, that's so kind of you. <laughs> Get back in the car, put your window up, we're walking. So we just walk off and you see him go, what the fuck? <laughs> you can almost imagine the conversation in there. What are you doing? I just kiss him. You know, so I went, no. So we walk on. And then the car comes, creeps up, 
And now this time he's, he gets out. And he goes, I said, you are just too much. Get back in that car. I'm telling you. So he gets back in. He, he looks at the window. He says, are you a traveler? And I was trying to work out what he thought was like Romany and maybe we, they got some sort of sympathy with travelers or something, you know. So I said, yeah, I'm a traveler. Get Fellow back. Traveler, yeah. okay, see you, man. Thanks for the offer. And we walk on now. Next time they're having none of it. They've all gone. Rah, 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 rah. So next time they all jump out the car. And one of them's got a knife. There's a little one. He's got a knife. And you go, we go, oh, oh, now we, now, now penny drops. Now, now we get it. There's a knife involved. And he's just going, Wah! and Linda's screaming. Linda's going, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? She's saying, leave him alone. He's a musician. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a musician. Leave me alone. <laughs> I don't know what she thought that was going to do. Anyway, we said, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Camera, camera. Yeah, OK, go on, you can have it. Money, mo yeah, OK, go on, yeah. And, and we, demo tapes Demo well. tapes, which are no use to them at all. Uh, we presume they re-recorded over them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think they probably recorded over them. Or did that set you back? I mean, did that matter them. that the demo tapes had gone? I mean, I know you've, you've said to me before that in the, in the days when you were writing songs with John, if you couldn't remember the tune in the morning, it wasn't worth it. So is that is that the way you did it? You yeah, went straight well, back into the studio? Yeah, we can't, I, I did remember them, you know, yeah. yeah. So uh, well, there was nothing to go on, but I... I remembered them luckily, yeah. yeah. Uh, band on the Run itself, the, the title track, I mean, it's got that sense of, uh, of a band well, you know, on the run that, you know, you, you've become outlaws to an extent. That Did was very well said. That was terrible. <laughs> that wasn't planned. If we'd only rehearsed this, I you know. know? Um, but that guitar riff, that thing that starts at the beginning, uh, mm, you know, because mm, 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 mm. it's a symphonic structure, it's a three-part structure to that song. Oh, yeah. When you write, oh, you're not going to go with that, are you? <laughs> it just happens. You well, go I in the studio and it... symphonic structures. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was, um, yeah, I don't know what it was. I think there was a bit of a thing that people were doing, you know, Townsend had done a rock opera. Yeah. And so it was opening the doors a little bit to sort of expanding. And um, so I would do it a few times, and that was one of the times when I thought, yeah, this would be perfect. And um, in the air, there was a lot of kind of desperados, renegades, you know, criminals. And so I thought of band on the run. And I thought, okay, well, to be on the run, we've got to be incarcerated first, so we'll do that. And so I did a little bit about that, and then they break out, and then, and then it, the tempo comes up. No, it was a nice one to do. It's still a good one to do on stage. You know, yeah. it kind of works, the, the, the three parts. Question now from a fellow working musician, another Master Tapes, former Master Tapes guest, in fact, Mr. Paul Weller. Hey, Paul. Do you ever get frustrated with, uh, with not being able to play more of your new stuff live that people want to hear? Naturally so as well, like more of the Beatles stuff. But do you ever get frustrated? Like I'm thinking about it with Memory Almost Full or something, which I thought was one of your best records, one, you know, amongst your most best tunes mm. Mm. but does it ever frustrate you that you don't feel you can put out to people yeah, yeah i think it does you know but um yeah I, you would always like to just do the songs you want to do whether they're hits or not um but you know i'm, I'm a realist and the main thing i think if i go to a concert i want to hear the songs i love from this artist so you know, if it's the Stones, then I'm probably going to want to hear Honky Tonk Women's Satisfaction and Ruby Tuesday, whatever, you know, uh, just because I like those songs. And if they didn't do them, I'd feel a bit cheated. So I translate that to me and I sort of think, well, OK, we'll, we'll give them what we want as long as it's stuff we like. And so we're constantly trying to switch those around so they're kind of fresh. And so it's like, oh, I've never done this one before. Um, but... Yeah, and then occasionally we throw in songs and, you know, I'll sort of say, you're not going to like this one, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> and you, you can tell in a big arena what it is, is when you do, you know, I give her all my love, cameras, blurr, all the lights come on, all the iPhones, it's like starry night. <laughs> and then you'll kind of go, you know, and here's one of our new album, 
black hole. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so, you know, it is a bit frustrating. You know it. Um, but yeah, but he, he, he'll stick only a few jam songs or style council songs in a set, and mostly it will be new stuff. And the point you made about the Stones... Yeah. That's why I'm not playing stadiums properly. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> there, there is that. <laughs> you, can, you can watch and learn. The other thing is you kind of hope they're going to catch on by the end of the tour, but it's kind of hard. It's a hard slog, you know. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm quite happy to... I, I figure these people pay a lot of money to come and see me, you know, and I remember seeing Bill Haley, <laughs> that's going back, but, um, you know, and I was a little kid, and short trousers at the Odeon in Liverpool, and I paid like a fortune, it was like months of pocket money to go and see him, and it was such a thrill, because he opened with one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock rock, yes, and, you know, I was like, that's what I wanted to hear, I didn't want to hear him doing anything else, not really. So Wings got you back there on, on the road and, and broadened your musical ambitions. With, with McCartney 2, for instance, which is, what, 1980, you're back doing the same thing you did with the first album, o mm. overdubbing yourself. And, and coming up on that album, which was the really, you know, the niggly pop single, which got you back there into, mm. into the pop charts. It's also said that John Lennon heard that on the radio in New York, and he was going back into the studio at the time. Mm. He was making Double Fantasy, and it... And it mm. It may have got him back and sort of upped his game again. Do you, is it, uh, yeah, did you hear I, that from I his heard camp? that, yeah. I think his engineer at the time said that. Said, oh, yeah, John heard coming up and thought, uh-oh, better get back to work, you know. That happens with with people, certainly within the group. Mm. If John had come up with like a brilliant song, I'd go, okay, let's try and be brillianter. You know, then he'd go, right, oh, good. And he'd try and be... So we were always trying to um, get better than each other. Creative competition when you were yeah. writing um, together. I think it was really good for us, you know, because yeah. it just kept up in the game. But just taking you back to 1980 and hearing that John's in the studio again and, and he's heard coming up, that must have been great for you because relations were still pretty strained at the time. Mm. Yeah, as I say, the business thing had sort of split us apart, really, because um, I'd had to fight to keep what today is the Beatles' company. It wouldn't. It would have been Alan Klein's company. Yeah. And that was really happening. Uh, so I had to sort of fight, and as I say, I had to fight the others, which was the worst decision of my life, you know. Anyway, but yeah, um, so I would make uh, calls to John occasionally, and it was a bit, yeah, what do you want? Uh, uh, what do you want? You're <laughs> doing the silly bugger stuff, you know. And, <laughs> I, you know, I was getting annoyed at him and calling him, like, silly insults. Saying, you know, because by then he'd got a little bit of an American accent. Yeah, what do you want, you know? I said, all right, Kojak. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was coming back at me with, like, insults. Anyway, so it was a bit like that. But in the end, um, we, we persevered long enough for it to break through. And, like you say, music... Um, brought us together, he said, yeah, that record, you know, uh, yeah. I Can Help, Billy Swan. Have you heard that record? Oh, yeah. He played it for me, you know. So, uh, so th what, that was one of the things I was really grateful for, was that we got it back together yeah. before he died. Because, yeah. uh, you know, it would have been, like, very difficult to deal with. I mean, it was difficult anyway, but it would have been especially difficult. So it, it was kind of good. We, we had a really good relationship. And we just taught kids and baking bread and ordinary stuff, you know. And you got a chance to talk to him again a couple of years after he died through music, Tug of War album, Here mm. Today. That song is very much a conversation with John, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, hang on, look at me. Let's hold up. <coughs> Another snippet. Um, yeah, you know, I was... I've got uh, a studio down south, and this was before it was a studio. And I, I just built, uh, I just bought the house. And so upstairs there were a number of little rooms and just bare. And uh, I was thinking about John, you know. And it was like all the things you never said. So it was like, mm, mm, mm. It was like, mm, mm, mm. And if I said I really knew you well, what would your answer be? If you were here today, ooh, here today, 
etc. Yeah. But it was nice because it, it kind of reconnected me with him, yeah. even though. And I do that in, in the concert now, and it, it's, it's good because, you know, it's, it's like he's there. And you've done that again more recently on the new album. There's a song called Early Days on that album, isn't there? Which takes you right back to, again, with John wearing the leather jacket, buying records, hanging out in town. And there's a kind of, there's a message in that, in that song, almost to the critics, to the people who have all got a story about the Beatles, about who said what, who to what and why and how. It's split up. And this is you saying, no, I know because I was there. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's, that has to be true. Because uh, the stuff I'm talking about and our relationships where there's just two of us in a room, um, I have to know better than someone commenting on it. Uh, and, you know, you read the books because there's a lot of books about the Beatles and a lot of theories. And I try not to read them. And whenever I do, the first thing is like, oh, that's wrong. You know, McCartney wrote this in answer to Lennon's acerbic. And then I go, no, I didn't. It was like, it wasn't anything to do with that. So, um, yeah, you know, so in early days, it, it was about me just remembering walking down Mather Avenue, where I was just the other day, actually, I was at my old school, Lipper, and uh, I always take the opportunity to sort of drive around and do the tour, and especially I've got someone with me. There was where the first gig was. There's where John's mom lived over there, and there's where I live, you know. And, uh, yeah, so we were, that's where I, the image was of me and John, walking down in the drainies and the black jackets and the guitars over our shoulders, you know, before we were discovered. Dressed in black from head to toe, two guitars across our backs, we would walk the city road, seeking someone who would listen to the music. That we were riding down at home. That's what that song was about. But the point you were making was at the end of it, yeah, I do sort of say, well, you know, how can you, how can you know when you weren't where it was at, you know? Okay, another question now comes from a long-time Paul McCartney fan, somebody who describes himself as a working actor, Mr. Simon Pegg. Songwriting is obviously a very personal process. You strike me as a very private man. When it comes to writing those really meaningful, truthful songs, uh, do you ever feel like if there's a challenge about giving too much of yourself away? Do you ever feel there's a little sort of tension between being honest and keeping things, you know, because it's, it's mm. good to keep things to yourself? Uh, yeah, it's funny because I think just in real life, I would find that a challenge. You know, I'd, I'd like to sort of not give too much away. Like you say, I'm, qu I'm quite private. I think, well, why should people know my innermost thoughts? That's for me, they're innermost. But in a song, that's where you can do it. That's the place to put them. So that's one of the things I love about songs. You can, uh, you can start to sort of reveal truths and feelings. Um, you know, like in here today where I'm saying to John, I love you. I couldn't have said that really to him. You know, unless we were extremely drunk. I love you, man. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you, you find, I think, that you can, you can put these emotions and these deeper truths um, and sometimes uh, awkward truths. You know, I'm scared to say I love you and things like that. You can put them in a song, whereas you couldn't just say it. It would sound daft if you just said it. Uh, so that's one of the things I like about songs. Okay, another question now comes from uh, Siobhan Salisbury L. Siobhan. Actually, I'm really nervous. Um, who in current music inspires you to keep writing? I like James Bay. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's great. Um, I th there are a lot of great people. Uh, Ed Sheeran's very good. You know, Sam Smith's a great vocalist. Um, I love Rihanna. And I love Kanye. You know, because he's... And he's, he loves you too. He does, he does, he loves me. But he's, uh, you know, people say he's eccentric, which you'd have to agree with. But um, he's, a, he's a monster, you know. He's, he's a crazy guy that uh, comes up with great stuff. So uh, 
He inspires me. Did you write directly with him on those collaborations that you've done, or did he just take the melodies that existed already? Well, I mean, we we sat around, and um, and I didn't know how we were going to do it. So I just, but someone had said, oh, Kanye wants to write with you. So I thought about it first, thought, do, do I want to do this? You know, it's like, this could be loaded. And I thought, yeah, of course I do. And I, the, the thing was, well, if it doesn't work, we just won't tell anyone. <laughs> uh, that was the agreement, you know. So um, I would be sitting around and just sort of, and just sort of doing things, you know just grooving and stuff and talking, yeah, well, what do you think, man? And they were recording everything on the iPhone, you know. So we're just doing this and doing chords, you know. And then, and I didn't hear any more about it on that particular thing. Then I got this, I got this record, which was like uh, a Rihanna song. And it was like, I thought, I said, well, where am I? He said, well, we've sped you up. <laughs> And in, in the middle of the record, if you listen to it, there's a little voice goes, I'm out of mystery. Then I heard you was talking trash. I'm out of mystery. That's me. <laughs> Did you mind that? No, I loved it. Yeah. You're kidding. Right, okay. What's wrong with that? I'm out of mystery. So, yeah, I mean, but that's the thing. You know, you say you just work with him and then you leave it for a little while and let it marinate and just hope he gets back to you. Does that challenge you musically if you work with somebody outside the usual comfort zone? Does it make you go yeah. to the studio next time and start thinking of things in a different sonic way? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it was definitely was different because we never appeared to write a song, you know. And I'm telling him, I was telling him about this time when uh, my daughter Mary was born. And um, so a lot of what we did was just telling each other stories. And I said, um, there was this, we were in the hospital uh, with the birth of this new baby, you know, and we were glowing with, with the whole joy of it all. And I'd been watching, been looking at this uh, Picasso picture, a man with a guitar, he's sort of like this Picasso. And I'd been looking at it all week and thinking, you know, he's, he's good, good painter for him, you know. And uh, then I suddenly thought, what's that chord he's playing? Ah. And I, I looked at the chord and it was these two fingers here. I was like, <laughs> I thought, ooh, that's a lovely chord. So I started to try and write something just using two fingers all the time. So, and then I whistled the melody, which is what I did for Kanye. Two fingers. Two fingers. Two fingers. Anyway, it goes all the way through it in two fingers all the time. And I was telling that to Kanye, and he went, oh yeah, great man, you know, yeah. He didn't appear to really notice. And then, uh, then I, after Christmas, I get this uh, track back, and it's like, he's singing my melody, yeah. and he's made it like seriously he's urban. Yeah. And that was, that was a thing called All Day. Yeah. All day, all day, all day, all day. The lyrics are like, you know, this is the N word, re, re, a lot. <laughs> you know, how long have you been at the mall? All day, N word. And then, where you know that? All day, N word. And it's a great record. So, well, the thing was about that when I got it and people heard it, uh, quite a few people said, "You can't be connected with this." You know, it's like 40 N-words. And people are going to say, you know, wait, man, you know, you shouldn't do that. And people like Oprah, um, who are a little conservative about that stuff, th she says you shouldn't do it. You know, even black people shouldn't use that word. Mm. I said, yeah, but it's, it's Kanye. And he's talking about an urban generation that uses that word in a completely different way. So it's all that context then. Yeah. And you're, you were happy so it's that. a context, yeah. you know. So, yeah, so I, I, I was actually pleased with it. Let's have another uh, question now, another song. Let's have a song from James Francis. 
uh, who's a web designer from the Rhondda Valley in South Wales. James, welcome to Master Tapes. Thanks. Hey, Paul. Hi. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit about how two giants like Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson went about writing songs together? Who got the final say? The guy who made Thriller or the Beatle? Um, yeah, no, it was uh, it was good writing with him, you know, because the thing is, you know, I'll write with someone if I really admire them. And Michael was admirable. You know, he was a great singer. And uh, he didn't really write much at that time, but he rang me up and asked if, if we wanted, he wanted to, if I wanted to make some hits. So I said, well, sure, you know, so... Uh, he came along and we we worked together and it was very equal actually you know we'd I'd suggest a bit he'd suggest a bit um and the same when it came to the studio you know it, it wasn't either of us dominating the other um you know i i suppose i could have really tried to take the lead role but he was too good you know and you you wouldn't want to uh, so you know we just like say 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 together and um, it, you, you've got to up your game when you're working with someone like Michael. You can't just slob around, you know, because he's so on it. Say, say, say what you want, but don't play games with my affection. Take, take, take what you need, but don't leave me with no direction. All alone, I sit home. Time for one last question now, and it's uh, from another singer-songwriter who spent time in a pretty successful band. In fact, he's another former Master Tapes guest, Noel Gallagher. Hello, sir. <laughs> I Morning. was out with uh, two of your wonderful daughters on Thursday, Stella and Mary, and I told them I was coming here today, and they were saying, you're going to ask a question. And I said, I don't even know what to ask. So on behalf of them, they have asked me to ask you... <laughs> Out of the two of them, which one's your favourite? <laughs> Neither. I can say for the record that Stella said you would say Mary, and Mary agreed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they, they're both incredible, you know, and you, you really can't do that. Uh, much as Stella would like me to. She said, Dad, I'm the golden child, I'm the golden child. She did use that phrase. <laughs> 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 no, they're, they're both fantastic in their own way, as you know. They're both, they are both classics. Yeah. Okay, many songwriters talk about songs being like their children, so I mean, to apply the same logic to the songs, which yeah. it, can it come down to the best song that you've ever written, your favourite song? Um, I mean, I get asked that question. And I always would say, oh, I don't know, you know, they're like babies and you can't have a favourite. And then I got fed up with saying that. So I said, here, there and everywhere, just because I think it's quite a complete little song. Um, I also think Yesterday is special. Yesterday's special because I dreamed it. And so that doesn't happen, you know. So that kind of like arrived onto me. So I have to feel something sort of special about that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, then I'll kind of change, and I'll sometimes I say, why don't we do it in the road? <laughs> 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 why don't we? You could do that one, Akapan. No one will be watching us. <laughs> why don't we do it? I would all join in. Well, that's all we have time for in this very special edition of Master Tapes. Head to our pages on the Radio 4 website to hear all the previous editions. Thanks to our audience here at Maida Vale. And, of course, to Sir Paul McCartney. Thank you. There's a lot of mythology that surrounds the Beatles and him and, you know, everything he's done since. And I, I, as he said, it, it, it's frustrating for him to see it told in different ways. It's great to see it coming out of the horse's mouth. I find him a fascinating person and a, and a, a wonderful person. He's incredibly amiable and fun. And it's lovely to be in the presence of someone who is literally a living legend. You know, he just is. It was a real big deal and an honour to get to just listen in and 
and I suppose collectively and you know everybody involved kind of got to pick Sir Paul's brains and, and, and you know I was able to work out well I was able to learn something about yeah how to do this you know live this kind of crazy musician life for longer than a couple of years which is uh, and to be able to learn about it from someone like Sir Paul is not something you get to do ever let alone very often so it was a huge honour I think he as a melodist is second to none and he's not a bad lyricist either he's an amazing bass player he's a pretty good drummer um, what I learned today was that he doesn't he didn't even mention the drums when people were talking about his multi instrumentally uh, he didn't mention the drums and he's a, he's a pretty good drummer Simon will you shut the f <laughs> peg Jesus um, it's always like this he's always got to make it about himself <laughs>